okay, well, a little bit about myself. Um, Tracy Stewart started my career in dentistry as a 16-year-old dental nurse, uh, then went into reception and various roles. I was one of the first treatment coordinators in the country at 19 and then becoming a practice manager. All the courses that we run were piloted uh, before they were released to the dental profession and we now tailor the programs to really suit the needs of, of the business, whether that be a single day program or whether it be an 18 month uh, program. Now in my experience, communication is one of the main causes of stress in the dental practice. And um, after all, if we communicated well, then I believe that there would be far less divorce in the country. And um, we've got to start this off with really vision. Uh, when I actually go into practices, um, I do find that people kind of shrug their shoulders when it comes to vision and, and goals. But if we, we don't share what the vision is, we don't share why the practice is there, what it's about, what expectations are of the dental team, then how can we actually expect the dental team to perform? So it is really uh, the job of the uh, manager or the principal to, to be the leader and, and take people where they want to go. But it takes a very special leader to date, take people where uh, they don't necessarily want to go, but is actually right for the practice. Quite often when I'm in practices, um, there is a vision statement. It might be in a box gathering dust, or it might actually be pinned to the wall. But if you were to ask the team mem members, they don't actually know what it says or without looking at it. So one of the things that we uh, need to do is we need to take ourselves out of our comfort zone. As human beings, we, we fight change. Uh, we don't like taking ourselves out of our comfort zones, and so we will resist it, we resist it. The only people that I come across that actually enjoy change is, is a baby having their nappy changed. Everybody else will, will fight it. But the fact is, if you continue doing the same, then you're just going to get the same results. And if they're not working for you now, then they're not going to work for you in the future. And taking yourself out of your comfort zone, you've got to go through this process where it starts off with shock. And that might just be giving a name on the phone to some people. Uh, and then it becomes uncomfortable until it becomes familiar. And, and then it becomes routine. Now, you know, many people will actually say that if you feel uncomfortable, you fight change, that you're a negative person. It, it's just human nature. Give yourself a tap on the back and let yourself know that it's normal and, and you're alive and you're kicking. Anytime that I'm invited to speak at the BACD or the dentistry show, it's a great honour. But on that day that I get there and I've actually got the stage in front of me, I'm right there in shock because it's not comfortable. It's slightly different to what you do on a daily basis because there could be 500 people there, there's a stage and it feels uncomfortable. We've also got to look at whiffens. There's always whiffens. What's in it for me? Um, quite often, a uh, principal will ask me about uh, bonuses. Not everybody um, is, is, is actually you know, managed by money. Some, a lot of people actually want job satisfaction and they actually want to enjoy coming to work and, and enjoying themselves. You know, it might be the case that they're able to spend longer time with patients and offer a uh, better service of, of care because of maybe the systems that they've got in their practice, maybe diary management. So we've always got to look at, at with them. And you're going to be spending more time with your team members and each other than you're going to be spending with your, your family at home. So when you come to work, you do want to enjoy it. Um, you don't want to be getting up in the morning and thinking, oh, I've got to go into the dental practice again today. That brings me on to effective communication. In order for the communication to be effective, what happens is I'm sending a message, and I'm sending a message to you guys who are hopefully receiving it and hopefully can hear me. Um, but what happens sometimes is that the noises that gets in between the person sending the message and somebody receiving the message. And the only way you know that that message that you've sent has been delivered clearly 
is if that person then can carry out the task. Quite often, noises get in between um, the person sending the message and somebody actually receiving the message. And I'm not talking about your boss going around the surgery singing, we will rock you. I'm talking about noises such as vocabulary. For example, you could be talking to a patient about a treatment plan. But if the words that you have used mean something completely different to your patient, they may not then actually go and book the appointment, which was the desired result. And the same with your team members. If they don't carry out the actual uh, task that you wanted them to, maybe come back to yourself first and ask, did you actually deliver the message in the right way? Was your body language correct? Because if your body language is maybe a little aggressive, then the message you're wanting to deliver is probably not going to be received in the right manner. And also, if you're going to have a conversation, then to make sure that you choose the right time. You know, it may be a case that, that you've actually got time because you've just had an hour's cancellation, but your practice manager might be under pressure and, you know, trying to actually get UDAs, she may be doing appraisals. So if you're going to actually have effective communication, you want to make sure that you've actually got the time that works for both parties as well. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen the slide uh, like this, you know, communication, 7%, what we say, as in the words that we, we use, 38%, how we say it, tone and speed, and 55% body language. So, for example, I might say to you, where did you get those shoes? Where did you get those shoes? Now, you can't see me and you can't see my body language, but hopefully you will actually hear how that message has actually been delivered in two different ways. And the words were exactly the same. You know, it's a bit like if uh, I've had an argument with the other half and my mum comes to visit. And I'm very aware of body language, but she'll be in the house 30 seconds before she actually asks me what he's done. And this is all down to, to body language. Next, we move on to, to listening skills. Hopefully it won't upset too many of the men um, with, with man-type listening. But, for example, we have things such as filtering, where you only listen to certain parts of the conversation, but not all. So you're not really listening. And we're told to listen. We're not actually taught to listen. Judging is a form of listening, where you stop listening as you've already made an assumption and placed labels on the other person. Or rehearsing is when you're busy thinking about what you're going to say next, so you never really hear what the other person is telling you. And this can actually happen when you're using scripts. So if you've got a script and it's telling you exactly what to say, then you're not concentrating on listening to the other person. So how can you really understand what that other person wants. So where we need to get to is listening to understand and listening to care. And how we do that is by using um, the pull strategy. You've got the push strategy and the pull strategy. And we've all been trained really to use the push strategy. If a patient calls up and they inquire about tooth whitening, we give them all the clinical information that we know hoping that they're going to book an appointment. But when a patient actually makes a decision, they make that decision on emotion, and then they back it up with logic, and they, they buy solutions. So where you want to change is you want to come away from your push agenda, and you want to actually use the pull agenda. And the pull agenda is really asking the right types of questions so that you truly understand what it is that the patient wants to achieve. Now, we haven't got time to go through all these questions today, but for example, open-ended questions and probing questions are great questions. You want to avoid closed questions where a patient just comes back with a yes or no, where you want to use an open question, for example, uh, what would you like to change about your smile, rather than are you happy with your smile? The difference between an open and, and a closed question. And a probing question could be something like, tell me more. 
anything else. You're just actually prodding that patient to give you more information. And these questions can be used on the phone, they can be used in an email, they can be used at the examination when you're trying to find out what it is that the patient wants. As I say, people buy on, on emotion and then they back it up with, with logic. And listening to your patients shows that you actually care. It's astonishing really how many dentists still don't take photos at the initial consultation or the examination. What I could get a lot of my practices to do is to take photos and then use a pointer. For example, it could be a pen. Pop that in the patient's hand and get the patient to show you on the photo what's actually they're concerned about. So you're putting them in the driving seat and it's actually their decision. And um, people buy what they want. You know, I use the same principle myself. If I want a shopping trip, I make it my other half's idea. So using these questions makes a huge difference in the case presentation and acceptance. Now, when it comes to um, the telephone, uh, the telephone should never be seen as an irritation, no, how, no matter how busy your practice is. If you're really busy, um, then consider having something long, like an on-hold marketing system. And I'm talking about one that gives you choices, not one that just forces you on to, to listening to a message or, or music. And patients are going to actually form an opinion of your practice within 17 seconds of you picking up the phone. Uh, people can hear a smile on the phone. When I was in uh, practice management, if I couldn't hear a smile, then I would actually put a mirror on the front desk. I would make people look into it, smile, stand, and pick the phone up. Because this person is representing your business, and a smile is really important. If your phone is going to engage, then that is a disaster in this a day and age. Uh, over the summer, I needed to get a skip to actually sort my garden out. And I called three skip companies, uh, two were actually closed for lunch, and the one that actually answered the phone got my business. Now, interestingly, I did a, uh, a course in September and carried out mystery shopper calls to six practices. And five of those practices were actually uh, closed. Now, I know it was one and two, but you know, this is the time that your patients are available to be able to make these calls. So if you want patients to actually uh, become patients and book treatments, then you need to be around to pick the phone up. It's really scary that a lot of practices are spending you know, a considerable amount of money on marketing or search engine. Um, but then when the patient actually decides that they actually want to go ahead and contact the practice, the phone is engaged or you're close for lunch or people not there, or people just don't know how to actually handle the call. Which, to give you an example, uh, when you call practices and you ask about the cost of tooth whitening, just some of the responses that you get, uh, we do le legal Zoom. Legal. Uh, as a patient, I'm going to question, was it not legal before? Uh, Zoom on its own, it's a bit like out of the Batman and Robin uh, comic, comic, Zoom's at POW. You know, take me home systems and free syringes. We expect to take home curries and b and picnic benches. You don't expect to take home uh, quality dentistry. And your free syringes, well, if you're a drug dealer, they're probably going to snap them up. Uh, if you're somebody who's actually got a needle phobia, then you're probably going to terrify them. And then uh, combination, KFC do a great combo. Where you need to get to is you need to be asking patients questions. So when they ring in and they're asking you for the cost, you know, all you need to do to reassure them is, first of all, tell them that, yes, you are going to give them the cost, but you don't want to give it to them straight away. So can you tell me if you're taking, can you tell me how much you charge uh, for tooth whitening? Yes, I certainly can. Uh, you're speaking to Tracy, can I take your name? Flossie can ask, what is it that you're hoping to achieve with this type of treatment? Now, if you've been in dentistry a while, you're probably thinking, you know, is she barking mad? It's obvious that we want white teeth. 
but something will have happened for somebody to have picked up the phone, whether they've given up smoking, whether they've noticed their smile um, in a photo. So by asking questions shows that you care rather than just quoting fees at people. And also, if you do use finance in your practice, rather than quoting something like three to four thousand pounds from Invisalign or two thousand pounds for implants, maybe quote the monthly fee. So give the patient a monthly fee. You know, patients love the fact that treatments in our practice start from as little as ninety pounds a month, and treatments start from uh, fifteen hundred pounds. So you're not hiding any information, but you, you don't want to do that gulp factor where you actually give them a cost of £2,000 and then you've lost it because the patient's in their head gone, I don't have that type of money. So finance works, but you've got to use it in the right way. As does payment plans. Payment plans can actually be a good solution to NHS inquiries if you're a private practice. In my experience, what happens is um, the receptionist will say, no, we're private, and you've lost them, or sorry, or unfortunately. There's nothing to be sorry or unfortunate about uh, providing quality dentistry. Patients only know two questions. Are you taking on NHS patients, or are you taking on new patients? So one of the questions that works quite well, and I have a large dem plan practice that I work with at the moment, where they're converting between five and six out of ten calls. It does take some time to get your head around these questions and obviously building up confidence in using them. But if it didn't work, I certainly wouldn't have a business to run. So a great question when somebody actually dials in and says, are you taking on uh, NHS patients? It could be. Sounds like you're looking for a new dentist, am I right? I'm speaking to Tracy, can I take your name? Let me share with you how our practice works. Although we don't take on NHS patients, we have a fantastic dental plan which enables you to two checkups, two hygiene visits from £11 a month. Is this something you would consider instead of NHS? Now, if you've got a patient and they're adamant that they just want NHS, you're not going to get far through that conversation before they say, listen love, I'm only interested in NHS. That's not the type of patient that you're actually trying to actually attract to your patient. But don't take it personally, because we've all got different priorities in life. But if that is a patient who's looking for a new dentist, just by using questions like this, could be the difference between them registering with you and registering somewhere else. The other thing that we need to make sure that we do is we need to make sure that we track everything. Uh, most computer systems will give us a, a glossy report of how many new patients have made it through our door, but not so many patients track on the inquiries. So you want to know how many people have called your practice, how many people have um, contacted you via email and come into the practice. You want to know how many people have walked by. And you want to actually know how they've come to your practice. So was it social media? Was it an e-sign that they'd uh, received? Was it, was it a, a recommendation? And then perhaps you can thank that person. So you want to make sure that your tracking systems are robust. So you want to make sure that your tracking systems are right from that initial inquiry right through to how many people came in and maybe had an examination or a free consultation with the treatment coordinator, right through to what dentist did they see and did the patient actually take the treatment up. Emails are just as important. Uh, it's really quite scary how many people don't check emails properly. You know, emails actually go to spam boxes and uh, your patient's not going to be sitting there thinking, I didn't get a reply from my, my dental practice. I wonder if it went to their spam box. So you need to be checking, otherwise you could be losing patients. And they're going to leave with a poor impression of your business. I recently carried out a survey, and 67% of the emails I sent as a patient never actually got a reply. You wouldn't leave your telephone ringing for 24 hours, 
So why would you actually leave an email unanswered for the same amount of time? So you want a speedy re reply. You do not want an A4 sheet of how wonderful you are. It's all about the patient, not about you. So again, by using questions, what is it you're hoping to achieve? When did you first notice this? And if you've been aware of it for a period of time, what's prompted you to make the call now? Because there will always be a reason. And it's been really interesting because the practices that I work with as long-term clients, I'm actually BCC'd into the emails that they're sent and the reply that comes from the patient. And it's amazing how much information the patient will give you via an email because they feel a lot more comfortable not speaking to somebody. They're, they're actually giving you their entire life uh, story. And you might have two or three emails before they actually book an appointment. But when they actually come into their practice, they've already made a decision that it's you they've chosen to actually deliver the dentistry for them. The treatment coordinator role is an amazing role in practices. It's not for everybody. So if you haven't got a treatment coordinator room, then it's going to be very difficult for, for this role to work for you. I call it concierge dentistry. I, I call it it's an extension of the actual reception role. For example, recently I'd, I'd been to Cork delivering a training session. And we arrived at 6 o'clock in the morning, couldn't get into our room till 2 o'clock. The reception desk was really busy with patients checking in, patients, uh, hotel guests checking in and out. And the concierge actually took us to one side and took out our bags, looked after them, got a map out and told us where all the areas of interest would be to visit. Well, this is your treatment coordinator in dentistry because your receptionists haven't got the time to do this. And it takes all the non-clinical um, information away from the dentist and actually saves them time. And plus, a treatment coordinator team member will actually speak the patient's language. They can take the photos. They can find out what's important to the patient and why, and then present this to the dentist after they've actually had the initial consultation. Your treatment coordinators can present the finance. Patients are a lot more comfortable talking finance uh, with a team member than they are with the dentist. I tend to get a little bit more, more embarrassed. Also, uh, the treatment coordinator can overcome objections. So if it is maybe the cost, uh, you've got your finance options, whether it's a case of time, the treatment coordinator can talk about the different ways uh, and different types of appointments to actually manage their time. The treatment coordinator isn't there to diagnose. It is building the relationship, uh, asking questions, finding out what the patient wants. They can actually answer questions uh, about the cost before they go into the dentist. And what you'll find is by going down this route, when the patient actually goes in to see the dentist, one, they're far more relaxed, but again, they've already decided that they actually want to have the treatment because all the questions have really been dealt with. And just to show you how to use photos. Now, these are examples of before and after, but what you can do is you can also share stories. Now, you obviously need to have consent uh, of your patients to use photos. I do find that if patients actually know that the photos are only going to be used in the practice and they're not going to be on the website and they're not going to be in the Hello magazine, then they normally are quite comfortable. And plus, if they've had an outstanding patient experience in your practice, there shouldn't be any problems. But if you've got somebody coming in and they might have crowns and they're concerned about the colour of their teeth, but they've got crowns on, they, they don't know that there's anything else that can be done. Whereas you could bring this photo up and you could actually share Maggie's photo with Mary's. And you could even explain the story of, of, of what happened because everybody loves stories. That's why the Hello magazine is the first to actually fly off the shelf. But if you don't take photos in the first place, how do you actually expect to use them? And patients do like to see your own work rather than an image smile. If you are going to use imaging, just be really careful because if you present something, that's exactly what the patient is expecting. So you are going to need to be 110% confident that you can deliver that. 
if you're going to be showing photos, make sure you're using like for like. So you don't want to be showing a photo of a middle-aged man when you've actually got a young female sat in your surgery. Seeing is believing. You will probably see people walking down the high street in the summer and they've got a crop top and maybe the belly sticking out one side and the bum sticking out the other. But when they looked at themselves in the mirror, it looked okay. The mirror shows a very, very different picture. Um, having a photo works because you get the different views. You know, I'm in a practice tomorrow where it's an orthodontic practice where a 19-year-old came in with mum. Um, mum couldn't understand why her daughter was so worried about her teeth. Now, we have quite a large plasma screen in the actual uh, clinician's room, and there were actually three views. So, a front view and two side views. And as soon as the orthodontist put up the side view, mum said, I didn't realise things were so bad, I want her to have the best. So, seeing is believing. Um, I am running a photography course on the 8th of March if anyone's interested, but you know, photography needs to happen. You need to be taking photos in your practice and if there's anything you take from this webinar, uh, make it taking photos and take more of them. Well, success only stops when you stop trying and winning is much more fun than losing. I know that there's been a few technical hitches, but I hope everybody's heard everything. And if you've got any questions, then I'm more than happy to answer them. That's great. Thank you, Tracy, for that. And uh, sorry, sorry to you and everybody else about the technical problems. It is new technology. At least it proves that we're live and that yep. we're not a pre-recorded announcement, doesn't it? Having worked uh, part-time for 10 years now, I can sort of see it from both sides now. And the last time I went to the dentist, he said, he turned around and said to his nurse, who's obviously not, not very familiar with the, um, the, the surgery, uh, I don't want a short needle, I want one of those long ones. And I thought, do you realise you know, how that comes across to a patient? <laughs> you know, oh, I want a much longer needle than that. Um, Celia has yeah. asked about... Um, how to just to go back over how to answer patients who ask do you do national health service because yeah surely this depends a lot on what the practice is trying to do i mean is it the receptionist's job to discuss this even because the patient isn't accepted on the nhs until the dentist agrees so surely it's up to the dentist to discuss nhs or private because unless you're it's totally private you, you do not want to get everyone in through the door because many NHS patients end up as private patients or having some private treatment. So, so they may not even know what they want at that point. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. And it is that patients don't know what they want. So, for example, you know, if you're a mixed practice and you're taking on NHS and private patients, then you say, yes, we offer patients a range of treatment. Can I ask what's important to you when choosing a new dentist? Because depending on what the patient wants... Um, private treatment might be a better option. For example, it might not even be available in the NHS. Um, a great question, if it is a private practice, and it is one that the team feel really uncomfortable with, is if it's a patient that actually, uh, if it's a practice that don't have any NHS, what tends to happen is the teams tend to go, uh, no, we're private, or unfortunately we're private. And as soon as you give a negative, the patient's already put the phone down. So you've almost got to avoid answering that question and you delay the question, there's no point trying to convince the patient to come. So again, a great question would be, um, you know, sounds like you're looking for a new dentist, am I right? Then yeah, that patient... Or, uh, or what, what seems to be the problem? Yeah. You know, just so get I, them I to start having a chat. Yeah, I tend to steer away from sort of words such as problems because it tends to then get the patients trained into only coming to the dentist when they've got a problem. So it sounds to me like you're looking for a new dentist, am I right? They will give you some information and then you can say, well, let me share some information about our practice. What would happen uh, in our practice? You'd be invited in for a consultation. Now, not only would we check the health of your teeth, We'd actually check your gums, we carry out an oral cancer screening, as well as checking your jaw joints. And as a private practice, uh, we can actually offer this for £11 a month. Is that something you would consider instead of NHS? Now, 
if that patient's adamant that they just want NHS, yeah, so then you sort of turn around and say, gonna, well, no, I'm gonna not come. exempt from payment, so I have no choice. I just need to find an NHS practice. No, and also, Derek, what you can do is, as long as that patient, as long as that patient leaves with a positive experience, and you can say, well, Celia, if you don't find the NHS dentist that you're looking for, you're more than welcome to come back to us. Yes. So don't close the door on the patient. Let them know that you, you do want them, and if they don't find what they're looking for, then they'll come back to you. And also, if you don't have an NHS contract, I mean, I think the only thing you can do is say, uh, no, but we can do uh, a complete, a full, thorough checkup of your teeth, including X-rays and uh, and a report for whatever it is, you know, whatever you're charging, and yes. um, and then it's up to them, then, isn't it? And then I, I think, see, having made all the effort to ring you up or come in and talk to you in reception, if what you're asking is halfway reasonable, then I think there's a lot of pressure on the patient to say, well, you know, if it is only twenty five pounds or thirty five pounds, uh, then okay. I'll, I'll pay for the checkup because they, they're still retaining then the option, aren't they, then to either have it privately or get it, or well, they might think, well, I'll get a private treatment plan and take it somewhere and get it done on the NHS, which of course they never do. But you know, they, they, they would, you know, there's a good chance they will agree to that. Well, a couple of things that happen there, Derek, and um, I haven't sort of gone into the clinical side of it, but I sit in with dentists when I actually do my training programs, and a lot of the time a checkup is. Um, You've got a DO, uh, upper left six has got a DO, uh, the BPE is 2112, pop your tongue to the left, right, and the roof of your mouth. Well, the patient doesn't know what a two is. They don't know whether it's good or bad. Uh, they don't know that you've done an oral cancer screening. So the way that I actually work with dental teams is I get the nurses to lead the actual examination and ask questions. And we're having an amazing success with that in patients really getting involved in their exam. And coming back to talking about uh, consultations, if you think about it from a patient's point of view, a consultation is where nothing happens. So if your doctor refers you to the hospital for a consultation, you know it's just a chat. So if that's what your receptionist is saying on the front desk and you're quoting £65, um, a little bit less or a little bit more, then the patient's eyes, they're actually paying £65 just for a chat. So you need to actually let the patients know what they're getting for their money. So if you had David Lloyd and you had Fitness First, and they were both charging the same monthly amount, but one offered uh, free personal training, free weights, free classes, you're actually always going to choose the one that you feel is more value for money. Yes. Yes, that the uh, any sort of analogies with gyms, I'm unfortunately uh, lost on me, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that <laughs> there is. Uh, we're going to start winding up now because obviously everybody's uh, is coming to the end of the lunch hour. But I, I would like to say as well, just a tip from me from sort of 30 years in general practice, that there is a language of money. If something is 250 pounds, when people are talking to you, they won't say 250 pounds. If you listen to how people are used to dealing with large amounts of money talk about it and try and learn their language. They'll say it's about 250 or it's about 350 or if you step it up by a factor of 10, if you're talking thousands, someone comes in and says how much would it cost to have my mouth rebuilt, I, you know, you could say something like well, it would be about three, three and a half and they will know what you're talking about because of the context of the work that you're asking them to do. If someone says to you how much is a crown and you say it's three, 350, um, occasionally you'll get someone who idiot will turn around and say, what do you mean £3.50? To which the answer is uh, no. Uh, but uh, they, they will work out what your reference frame is. And I think if you're comfortable about talking about large amounts of money, then they, they get more comfortable about it as well. Um, if, you're ex if you were exercising the sort of man-type listening and missed half of the presentation, then don't forget it will be on YouTube. We will send you the link <laughs> so you can watch it again. Uh, we'll cut out all the technical stuff and it's going to look really slick and though it all went really well. Um, we would really appreciate it if you would fill in the very short questionnaire. It's only what did you think of the webinar, is there any way we could improve it because we really want you to help to make these webinars even better. Um, if you're going to the dentistry show at the NEC on the 1st and 2nd of March then the DFO will be on stand R53 so if you want to put a face to the voice then by all means do drop in and say hello. And also, Tracy is going to be speaking at 
on Saturday the 2nd of March at the Dental Fusion Workshop and that's all entirely free and everyone gets free verifiable CPD for that. So talking of uh, CPD, we're trying to encourage people to listen to these webinars and join Dental Fusion. So we're offering a discount code to anyone who listens to this podcast, either live or in its recorded form on YouTube. So if you go to dentalfusion.org and enter the code 1971, that's 1971, when buying a membership online, you get 10% off either the practice or the associate membership, and that's valid until the 31st of December. Um, now the thing that may be more relevant for this webinar is that DCPs can join the DFO for a pound. That is literally one year's annual membership of the DFO for a pound, and that gives you access to the one hour free verifiable CPD for watching these webinars, the DFO webinars, and, if, and other member benefits. And if you join and want your one hour for this webinar, then I'm sure we can be persuaded to give you that. So I hope it's been worth waiting for the end of the webinar. And anyone who's given up two minutes ago will have missed all that stuff about the free code and the membership for a pound. So it's been worth you while hanging on to the end. So thank you, Tracy, very much for that thank very you. interesting uh, presentation. And perhaps you and I could get together and organize some more webinars on things like um, tangibility and how to use whiteboards in uh, examinations and intro cameras. Uh, in other words, how to, you know, how, how to uh, get across to patients uh, the, real, the real value of what they're paying for. Uh, that about wraps it up. I hope it's been helpful for now. So thanks for your time and attention.